now I get to share with you. How many of you enjoyed last week? Last week was awesome. And now it's this week. And then there's next week and the week after that. Praise the Lord. You know, just praying about the message, you know, I take it very serious. We have guests. I have other people share. We have different things happening and going on. It's my responsibility as a spiritual leader or clergy or the shepherd of this house to prepare you, amen, to inform you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, my job is not to give a message. My job is to give the Lord's message and to warn you and to help you, uh, to guide you along uh, in this thing that we called life. Uh, and, and, and by the way, you know, the message is not just a bunch of individuals, but this is a corporate word. I believe it's a fresh word. You know, uh, a lot of you work full-time jobs. you got so much going on. I know you're doing your own spiritual exercises, but it is my responsibility to bring forth an inspired word of God. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I'll tell you right now, if I'm not inspired, I'm sitting down because I don't have to give a message. And in, inspiration means to be inspirited. How many of you love to be inspired? We, we see movies, we have music, it just inspires us. And that is so important that, that we understand that. Once again, we are in times now where, you know, the social media, the culture in which we live is geared more towards the flesh than the spirit. And so there's this battle going on, you know, um, I think it's funny, you know, I see this bumper sticker, I would never have it on my car, but God is my co-pilot. No, God is my pilot, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't want to be at the controls. And, and, I, and I can't encourage all of you enough. Uh, this word promise was coming up a lot. The promise is the promise. Uh, in the Greek, it's, it's, the, it's, it's actually epigelia. It, listen, it means a divine assurance of good. You know, and the Lord's always reminding me, when my children come to me about problems and situations, I try to explain to them that there's a better way, that Abba knows what he's doing. You know, they, they get a little disgruntled. How many know what I'm talking about? And then, of course, after I meet with them, you know, um, the Lord's like, you do the same thing to me. Uh, I know what's best for you. Uh, one of my prayers is I always pray, Lord, give me what you want to give me. Don't give me what I want. Amen. And, and so I want to challenge you because I don't have all the answers. Uh, I don't have the itinerary. Neither did Moses. Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, the Lord would lead us. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I believe up to this point, the Lord is leading us. And so I'm very encouraged and confident in saying that with all my heart. Uh, and with that, you know, we always want to try to look ahead and we know that prophecy is of no private interpretation. We're just full of our opinions. We're just full of it, right? We're just full of ourselves. And that's fine to have conversations or theories or whatever it is. But the bottom line is that the Father is going to fulfill his prophecies. And people would say, well, how come there are prophecies in the Bible? I've said it before and I'll say it again. God shows us these prophecies to prove that he is God. Okay, and matter of fact, your Bible is one third prophecy. So, in hindsight, how many of you know it's real easy to see the prophecies in hindsight? Uh, but to look ahead, uh, it can get a little sketchy. There's a lot of gray area, and, and I really believe as well, uh, we've been taught a lot of things among evangelicals as far as eschatology that seems to be a little fear driven, it's, a, it's scary. The book of Revelation and black helicopters and the Antichrist and the tribulation. And we're like, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, and, and I really believe that we should have common sense. There's a reality. But I also believe that it's good news in the last days. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation is Jesus revealed. How many know what I'm talking about? So, yeah, the world is a scary place if you don't have Jesus. And, and I want to share this with you because this is where the Father has me right now at, at, at my age. Uh, at 52 years of age, is the simple fact that uh, I'm looking at life in a way that there's a lot of options, a lot of opportunities. As I get older, I love options. Somebody will say something, I'm like, well, you know, let's look at our options, you know. You'll take your car to the mechanic, you know, and he'll tell you some things, and, and I love it, and they'll give me some options. Well, Mr. Plumber, this, this is safe, or you can get by with this. Let me know what I'm talking about. And, and that's really what our life is about. Show me my options, you know, because it's just like the children of Israel, when they get out of Egypt and their, their back is up against the wall of water, 
and here comes Pharaoh, it seems like there's no other option. But then what does God do? He parts the waters. You know, it's interesting. I believe in Christian counseling. I believe in deliverance. And I remember uh, meeting with a gentleman who was kind of uh, meeting with me and counseling with me because I was a pastor and everything. And, uh, and so we, we were talking. He, he said, y- y- you know, Nick, he said, something I noticed about you that you are very serious about your identity. You want to know who you are. It really stands out. You know, and, and I have to agree with that. My, my identity means a lot to me. How many of you that we're just uncovering our identity every day? How many of you know what I'm talking about? So I want to share this. And I want to inspire you because, you know, there's so many things happening in your personal life. When I share these things, I get a lot of people come to me saying, wow, Pastor Nick, I was experiencing this or I'm going through this. Why? Because I think we're all going through something together. But it's how we respond, right, will dictate your future. It's how we react. It's the decisions that we make from here on out. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Just like we have those signs out front, teaching the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. It's like a catchphrase, right? Like, make America great again. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, wait, teaching, Hebrew roots, Christian faith. Hey, I want to go in there. I'm interested. You know, and this is where we got to be careful, even with our verbiage, you know. Uh, People would say things like, well, I'm not a Christian in this movement or whatever. Of course you're a Christian, You know, you need to speak the verbiage that people understand, like the word church and Christian. Gentile is not a bad word. Nations, I'm not a Gentile. Well, yes, you are. And and this is where we've gone wrong because then walls go up. And we can't really share with somebody because now we're not even identifying with the things that they can identify with. You know what I'm saying? Like when I meet pastors, I ask them, what's your vision? What's God called you to do? How'd you get into the ministry and stuff, see? Because that's, that's the, we all have a story. So this, this is called identity crisis. Amen? Identity crisis. And, and I want to kind of put these things together because it's like I'm going to be in a therapy session today for myself, and all of you get to join me. Okay? And, and, and I like to be honest. You know, some, my wife says, you share too much. I said, listen, I'm just going to be honest. I just want to be honest. Right? There's enough honesty is the best policy. Have you ever had to lie, then you got to lie for the lie? Why? Why? Just tell the truth. Amen? Are you guys ready? Now, here we go. This is, this is going to be great. This is brand new, right off the heavenly press. It's like challah bread every week, you know. Whew. Here comes the aromas. And you might even be smelling some chili from next door. Here we go. Here we go. Let's go. Identity defined. Identity defined. Are you ready? Because I have the clicker. Do you like that? The fact of being who or what a person or thing is. This is the definition. The fact of being who or what a person or thing is. Now, I'm not going to get into all the debates about transgenders and all of that, but how many of that's very confusing? To be born a male, but you want to be a female. I'm born a female, but I want to be a male. How many of you know that that's confusion? Now, I'm not denying what a person is going through. But I believe if you're born a male, you are a male. If you're born a female, you are a female. That's just scientifically proven. Now, what you have to work out and work through is, is of course, your own personal life. How many know what I'm talking about? Why? Because... Babylon is confusion. And it's interesting that the parallels or the contrast that we are faced with every day, are we in Babylon or are we in Jerusalem? What is it about in the book of Revelation? Isn't it about two cities? One is Babylon, one is Jerusalem. What city do you live in? What's Jerusalem? City of peace. Even in my own home, you know, there has to be peace. It's called organized chaos. I refuse to live in dysfunction. I don't like dysfunction. It, it, we have to come out of that stuff. Amen. And, and I'll just be honest with you. A lot of us, we never saw healthy, strong marriages. So then we get married and we suffer. How many know what I'm talking about? I don't have no awesome examples around me of some great marriages. So what do I got to do? I got to wing it. I got to make mistakes and have counseling, right? And, and, and my wife is real sweet and peaceful. Well, she used to be. 
till the kids pushed her to the limit. We've had meetings. I pulled off to the side today. I said, you know what you're doing to your mother is dangerous. You guys are on, I'm, I'm warning you, she's going to get you. Oh, I'm scared of your mother. What is wrong with you kids? <laughs> Remember, they say, watch out for the quiet ones. Remember what I'm saying? Oh, she's so quiet. And so- yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so as we move forward, as we, even in this new year, Gregorian New Year of 2020, I want to encourage you to get your identity, to really sit back and even contemplate this. And I know this is even happening in people's personal lives. Some synonyms for identity would be a name, a specification, identification, or recognition. Some synonyms for identity would be a name, specification, identification, or recognition. You know, how do you identify yourself? How do you identify others? Amen? So we're going to get right into it now. Biblical examples of an identity change. Isn't it interesting that the, you see a lot of these changes in life in our, in our culture that are not good? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like people are changing not for the better. There's been changes, but they're not for the better. They're to the detriment of people or society. So we're going to look at Abram, Sarai, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabite, and Saul of Tarsus, okay? And so we're going to, right out of the gate, we're going to jump right into this. I'm going to show you people that had their identity changed. Say, that's me. That's me. Is your identity being changed? Did you used to be something else? And, and now you're evolving. I don't know the scientific term of a, of a caterpillar, but I guess it's, it's in the pupa, right? Pupa. And then you come out and you become a butterfly. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are in the pupa right now in your life. The chrysalis is so pretty. What a beautiful, the chrysalis is, then I go into the poop. Poop. And then I become a butterfly. Oh, and by the way, that if you see a chrysalis or this pupa, and you help that butterfly to get out, it will die. Because in its own struggle, it strengthens its wings and its life so that it can have a life. So if you're saying, man, life's kind of hard right now, it's because you're getting ready to fly. You're getting ready to fly like a butterfly. And the butterfly is a picture of the resurrection. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? You need this conflict. You need these problems and things because God is causing this because you're going to fly one day. Amen. There's so many bunny trails in this teaching, I have to avoid at least three of them. Because I can see I started to go down this one trail. Pull up, Nick, pull up, don't land. So let's read some scriptures together, amen. Let's check out Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let's look at Abram, public reading of scriptures. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Wow. So what's the first thing he's promising him? The land. So here's the thing. Not everyone's crazy about the land of Israel. They could care less. That's... that's Fine. Beit Tehillah loves Israel. We love the land of Israel. This congregation loves the land of Israel so much, we put it in jars and we bring it home. Dirt. We're on the mountains of Tekoa, and, 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 and I'm looking for Mike, and he's at the, you know, back in 2016, and he's, he's, he's down there with an empty water bottle getting dirt. I go, what are you doing, Mike? And he says, I want to take some dirt home. I mean, right? You guys are laughing at that, but I bet three of you have a pet rock at home and a mood ring. Maybe everybody should get a mood ring so I can figure out if I should talk to you or not. Oh, no, not now. So Abram was from Ur of the Chaldees. This is the modern-day country of Iraq. Iraq's not in the news, is it? Anybody got a timeshare to the embassy there? Anybody? 
You might want to go to Iraq. Have you ever wondered why there's always problems with Iraq and different things? Have you wondered? It's the seat of Satan. Think about it. Babylon. Saddam Hussein. Right? What did he say? I'm the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar, he said. He was rebuilding. He was rebuilding Babylon, the empire. What else is in uh, the modern-day country of Iraq or former Babylon? But the city of Nineveh. Was Nineveh in the news? Did Jonah read that newspaper? Nineveh? That's part of Babylon. So he's literally telling him, if you, if you read these verses, and, and I know this is redundant. I know I'm repeating myself. He asked him, listen, I want you to leave this country. I want you to leave your relatives and your father's house because I'm going to make a name for you. I'm going to make something out of you. Isn't that what God has done to you, Audrey? He's pulled you out of an area. He, he, you know, he's taken you away from your relatives, your father's house, and, and you're his. See, he wants a people for his name's sake. You have to understand this. The battle every day is do you want to be his son and daughter? Do you want to do what God wants you to do? We say it, but are we really doing it? And this is where we have to come to grips with this. That's why there's this wrestling. There's 17 works of the flesh. I've memorized this, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. There's 17 works of the flesh. And I don't have time for the devil. I have to crucify my flesh. And when I crucify my flesh, I submit myself to God. I resist the devil. He flees from me. He really has no place in my life. I am the enemy. I've discovered this. Every hard thing is just for me personally. It's not been from a person or a situation or a circumstance. I get up, I look in the mirror, and I say, you're going down. It's true. It's so true. So as we continue on with this verse, he says, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Do you see that? I don't have time to get into it, but I've already studied it for myself. I've proven it for myself. The Jewish people are God's chosen people. He made promises to them. Do you understand that? They were not even conditional. They weren't even conditional to some degree. As a matter of fact, a lot of Jews will admit the Holocaust because of their disobedience. But what I'm saying to you is that to say that God created this, this, this entity called the church to replace the Jewish people is false. It's totally false. God didn't create some new church entity. He's always had the church. It actually followed them in the wilderness. The church was in the wilderness. What is the church? A called out people. For his name's sake. We, we'll get into this a little bit. Remember, Moses went to Pharaoh. Let my people go so that they may what? Make sacrifices to me. Worship me. See, when we go down the wrong path, our life is not fruitful. We don't feel the purpose. We don't feel completed. Because you can go your own way like Fleetwood Mac. You can go your own way. So let's check out Abram. The name Abram means exalted father. Pretty cool, huh? Exalted father. What a great position to be in. That's, that's how I felt when Josiah was born. Right? Just one. Right? Then the story develops, you know, into what? We're going to get into that. Hey, I'm an exalted father. So God enters into a covenant with Abram. Genesis 15, 18. Let's read it. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. I'm not going to go into great detail. i am just created this. It's like cliff notes, amen? So there you have it. He's the greater vessel. We're the weaker vessel. He never breaks covenant. Did you know that? God has never broken covenant with us. We broke covenant with him. The sign of the covenant made with Abram was circumcision. Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. Let's check it out. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. 
And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. So the sign of the Abrahamic covenant is circumcision. Would you all agree? Now it's interesting because remember, Moses, you know, was chosen to be the one to deliver the people. He would be the the mediator, the, the spokesman, the best man at the wedding, even at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. So I want you to get this picture. So what happens? God's going to kill Moses because he didn't what? Circumcise his son. So would you say that circumcision is a big deal? If God's going to kill you over it, I would say yes. Okay? So the thing is, this is what's interesting. The wife circumcises the son. So apparently, Moses was supposed to circumcise his son, and he didn't. He procrastinated. So his wife stepped in and saved him. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Do you remember when uh, David was on the run or he was doing something, and, and he had some resistance by a gentleman who was giving him a hard time from the tribe of Benjamin? Remember that? King David, he, he was given a hard time by a Benjamite. And Abigail stepped in, saved her husband's life. Because if it wasn't for her, he was going to kill the guy. So remember, we're all intercessors. It's just like when somebody helps somebody else out in the public sector of life, whether it's robbing a bank or being kidnapped or mugged or whatever, or robbed, you know, innocent bystanders, you know, will, will step in, right? It's a natural reflex a lot of times. It's fight or flight. So we see this circumcision that happens. And then, of course, what happens? God changes Abram's name to Abraham, which means what? Father of a multitude. That's how I felt. The three boys, the four girls, you know, I, th I think that's it. I could be wrong, but I, 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 they say a quiver full is 12. I, I'm good. <laughs> I'm just over half. I'm good. My wife's good. We're good. We're good. I'm good. Now let's move on because you know that Abram has a wife. The connotation for the name for Sarai is contentious. And her name is changed to Sarah, which means what? Princess. Princess. You know, uh, I like some of the commentary. I like the Jewish sages because, you know, it makes you think about things. It's not literal. I'm not to it too much. But I, I think it's interesting that uh, even the story with Abraham and Sarah, you know, promised to have a child. You know, Sarah even says, well, hey, go in unto Hagar and I'll prove to you that it's you and not me. Well, she becomes pregnant. See, because it's just like we, we've been told, hey, we should live in Israel. We should be in the land of Israel. Well, how many of you think God's got to make the way? How many know what I'm talking about? We, we can't make anything happen. We can't make Aliyah. Just like I said, if I could live anywhere in the world and God, you know, would allow it, I would want to live in Israel. I'm beyond fear and doubt. I would love to live in Israel if I could, okay? And that's what we preach and teach here. If you could live anywhere, where would you want to live? How many of you would want to live in Israel? Just raise your hand, see? I'm just saying, absolutely. I mean, so, so we got to prepare ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves. So there you have it. There you have it. She becomes a princess. Amen. And that's the cool thing about the promise of Isaac. You know, he only had one wife. He was the only one that did it right. All the ones that had more than one wife had nothing but trouble. You know what I'm talking about? Because you can't even handle one wife. Amen. I've been married 20 years. My wife is an enigma. I'm telling you. I can't figure her out. She's complex, man. She's, I mean, really. Amen. I mean, think about it. You're nuts. Nuts. Think about it. So, because of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac could be born. He's the promise. You don't see a lot of drama in, in Isaac. He, now, he's got the curse of lying running through his family. That's my sister. We all know that one. But the bottom line is Isaac didn't have to go down to Egypt. He lived his life. You don't see TMZ out filming in front of his house. There's not a lot of drama with Isaac. Why? He's the promise. He did it right. Do you know when you do it right, there's less drama? 
Think about it. Remember, no drama Obama. That's what I liked about President Obama. There's no drama with him. He's straight up, you know, and, and then Trump comes along. Right? It's, it's a contrast, you know what I'm saying? The Twitter king. I mean, you know, he just, blah, he's just going to let you have it. I'm never going to cross that man. Amen? Think about it. So here comes Isaac, and he's the promise because it takes a husband and wife. Now we move into Jacob, Genesis chapter 25 and verse 26. Let's check out Jacob here. Let's read that verse. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So here comes Jacob. He's, he's got a twin brother, Esau. Esau comes out first, right? And then Jacob. Here's the prophecy. Remember in Genesis 3.15? Check this out. So what is, what is he? He's a heel grabber, isn't he? Is Jacob a heel, heel grabber? He's a supplanter. Like the connotation is kind of negative. Well, he's a supplanter and this and that. He's the heel grabber. Amen. It says here in this prophecy, Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now remember, the mother knew that something was going on in her womb, did she not? There's a rumbling going on, and it ain't Taco Bell. They were wrestling. There was something going on. And I believe Jacob was just simply reaching out to protect his head because Esau wanted to crush Jacob's head. See, if you know the prophecies, you know how the enemy, Hasatan, is trying to reverse it. He wants to be the head. See, Yeshua is the head. We're the body. Remember that? It goes so far to say that they put nails in Yeshua's heels. They literally were bruised. And you can't push yourself up when there's nails and you're, and you're, have you ever had a bruised heel? I've had a bruised heel. That is painful. So it's a prophecy. So Yeshua would have a bruised heel, but Satan's head is going to be crushed. Satan always wants to be the head. And that's why it's interesting because if you look at the first empire, thank you, Holy Spirit, if you look at the first empire in Daniel, the head of gold represents what? Babylon. Confusion. Chaos, false religion. That's what we're dealing with in the times in which we live. So just think about that prophecy uh, when you think about Jacob. Give him a little bit of mercy because he's just protecting himself uh, from having his head crushed and Esau having a bruised heel. And here we go. Jacob's name means heel grabber or supplanter. Jacob's name means heel grabber or supplanter. So uh, in Hebrew, his name is Yaakov. Yaakov. And it's interesting when you see the name Jacob versus Israel, we're going to get into that. Um, it's kind of like you just kind of regressed into your old ways when you're Jacob. So Jacob got his twin brother Esau to sell him his birthright for a bowl of soup and some bread. That's Genesis chapter 25, verses 30 through 34. So there you go. And what does it say that Esau despised his birthright? You know, it's kind of like when, when you hear these, these harsh words of hate, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That's actually in the Old Testament by one of the prophets. And then, of course, it's actually quoted, right, I believe by the Apostle Paul. But what, what God is actually saying, and I, and I want to encourage all of you today, what God is saying is that I'm looking for sons and daughters who will do my will and get their inheritance. That's what he was saying in regards to Esau. Listen, Esau really didn't want to carry on the kingdom or what I wanted him to do. He wanted to do his own thing, and that's disappointing. So you're fighting to be obedient, but at the same time, you want to attain to the promise. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So think of eschatology today as, hey, I'm attaining to the promise and to my inheritance. Why would you be scared? When the, when the, when the, when the estate attorney comes, you should be happy. You know, hi, I'm uh, the estate attorney. Run, hide. Yes, we have an inheritance for you. No, I don't want it. We have riches, we have land, you have 
butlers, maids. Don't want it. That's what people do every day with God. They refuse the estate attorney. Because see, I'm sharing this not out of academia. I'm sharing this out of my own personal revelation that God has revealed to me and through the word. I used to think about black helicopters and the Antichrist and tribulation in that context. But I'm excited about the last days now because I'm going after something. And you can't have fear when you're in the estate. Think about Prince Harry. Right? I'm stepping away from this stuff. I want to live my life. I want to do my thing. Right? I don't want those responsibilities. I'm not knocking Prince Harry. I'm just saying there's, there's, a, there's a shift in the earth today of where people want to be and where they don't want to be. It's like the Jewish people. You either love Jewish people or you don't. I've never heard anybody tell me, Pastor Nick, I think the Jews, they're all right. They're either blamed for something or you love them. They control the wealth and this and that and whatever. I've had people come in off the street and, and, and shout this to me. So look what happens. Through the cunning of Jacob's mother, Rebekah, he steals Esau's blessing from his father. Now, what did the mother say as she's conniving? Let this curse be on me. Because Jacob knew this was wrong. But he honored his mother, did he not? But because of that, he never saw her again. The curse was on her. If you say, let the curse be on me, because the curse can't come without a cause. You know, you can't curse people. People curse themselves. And a curse does not come without a cause. Does everybody understand that? So after many trials, Jacob prevails over man and God to have his name changed to Israel. Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Let's read it. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. I was encouraged this week. The Lord was telling me, you're, you're, you have to prevail against the sheep and the people. They're trying to drag you down. They're going to try to wear you down. You have to prevail over the people. It's not lorded over them. It's not be lord over people. It's funny, my own frustration is found in my own name, Nicholas. It means victory of the people, not over the people. So when you fail and falter and do things and make bad decisions or you go and make bad decisions or, or, or leave here and just whatever, it upsets me. Why? Because I want you to have victory. I want you to have what's coming to you, not what you're trying to bring down on yourself. You've got to remember that. And once you get this, it's life-changing because it's a paradigm shift. So we've all had a paradigm shift. We were all in the world and worldly and without Christ, and we weren't born again. Do you remember those days? That was a horror flick. Stephen King novel. I thought I was living. I'd have some good things happen. I'd get do some things in the flesh. That was great. But overall, my life really stunk. It was, it was not good. It really wasn't. Even getting a job or, or working or even having roommate, whatever I did, it really wasn't that good. I survived. Amen. Check this out. The name Israel means prevailing prince and co-ruler with God. Wow. It means he will rule as God. And typically his posterity or the, or the strongest concordance. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? He will rule as God. This is, this is terrifying. This is scary. Meaning you represent God. God, do we fall short? We say things we shouldn't say. We do things we shouldn't do. We think things we shouldn't even think. But God is like, but you are Israel. Do you remember when Gideon was threshing the wheat in the wine press and he was hiding? The angel of the Lord came, called him what? A mighty man. The guy's a coward. He's hiding. But see, God sees your potential. He sees your potential. And the biggest thing most of you have to get past is listening to those voices. Some of you are still listening to voices you shouldn't be listening to. I'm past all that. 
My sheep hear my voice and they obey. Right? So what are you doing in the name of the Lord? So when I say I believe in the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles, I believe that with all my heart. I believe it is the will of God. What I believe in the, the two houses be, coming back together, the two sticks becoming one, I believe this. I believe it's of the Lord. It's not my opinion. It's not what I'm thinking of. It's what he's imparted into me that is a truth in the Scriptures. It's not about converting everyone. It's not about winning everybody over to your own life. Your life is your life. Your faith is your faith. I've never kicked anybody out of here for eating pepperoni pizza. Amen? We teach you there's a better way. But you can celebrate Christmas. You can eat pork chops. I don't care. It's none of my business. But as a community, this is what we're going to teach. This is what we're going to do. Don't do anything unless you believe it. Amen? I'm telling you, that's a good word. I'm practicing my faith every day. What are you doing with your faith? I don't worry about my other pastor friend's faith. I'm worried about my faith. Where's my faith? Is it growing? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why, you know, you get all into social media and Netflix and Hulu and Bukalaka, and next thing you know, your faith hasn't grown at all, and you're wondering what's wrong with you. I'm no better than any of you. God just made me a representative for you. I'm just like you. I'm just like the director, right, on the cruise ship. I'm, that's all I am. I make sure the ship goes in the right direction. But I'm just like you. But I have to work out my salvation. I have to increase my faith. Because you know what the shield of faith can do in the armor of God? It can deflect all the fiery darts of the enemy. See, when your faith doesn't grow, you don't have a weapon. But look at all the followers I have on Facebook. Look how many hits I got on YouTube. Does it increase your faith? That's why a lot of ministers and ministries fail, because they're not increasing their faith. So everything I'm sharing with you, my faith needs to increase. Okay? I'm Abraham's seed. Uh, Galatians, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're in Christ, you're the seed of Abraham. Okay, how am I going to get there? I don't know. I've been promised land. Is this a good word? Now, I'm giving this to you because it's all right here. All of these people in the Bible experience what I'm sharing with you. Let's go to the next one. How about Joseph? Genesis 37, 3. Let's read it. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. In the Hebrew, it's pieces. He pieced together this coat. What does that sound like? Wow. A coat of many colors. A lot of variations. You know what I'm saying? So he was the favorite because Jacob loved Rachel, did he not? He loved her. And anybody who loves their wife and the children come forth, they're really going to love those children. Amen? How much does President Trump love his, his daughters and his sons? They're in everything. Do you see that? He's not so egocentric that he leaves them out. He brings them in, and people are challenging that. But what do you do if you're among the Levites in the Levi family? The family of Levi works together. How many know what I'm talking about? I'm just saying that's what all of us would want to do. I would love to be the president and have Josiah in my administration. Think about it. So Joseph was given a coat of many colors or pieces by his father because he was the favorite and Reuben lost the birthright. Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. I have my note here. I'm going to read it. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. So Reuben was the firstborn, was he not? And look what happened. Now we move on, because you see that, well, I'll just do this. I wonder if I want to do that or not. No, I don't. I don't want to do that. Think about the coat. Let's stay on the coat. 
In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, I want to thank Ryan for sharing this, these scriptures with me. Uh, this is so powerful. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Now what are you saying, Pastor Nick? What I'm saying is that we have to try to explain the phenomenon of non-Jews wanting their Hebrew roots. All over the world, this is happening. It says that God would write his Torah, what? On minds and hearts, and this, this movement has been hijacked. It's kind of hit a dead-end street. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, where is the Hebrews of the Christian faith movement going? Where is it going? Where does God want to take it? Not where it's at today. The Hebrew roots movement is stuck. Bashing the church, not working in the community, argumentative, divisive, controlling. And that's what's happened. In Jeremiah 31 9, it says, Ephraim is my firstborn. So, what I'm telling you, if we study this, this birth order, this birthright, or who has it. Reuben should have, should have had it, but he lost it. And Joseph gets this coat, and he's the man. Woohoo, right? Remember Johnny Osmond? Joseph, the Technicolor the dream coat? Woohoo, right? Well, then what happens to the coat? The coat goes to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim is the youngest, but he gets the birthright. Do you guys understand the storyline? See, everybody makes this mistake, like, well, Jesus just popped up in the New Testament. Here's Jesus. Hi. He's always been. So what are you saying, Pastor Nick? What I'm saying is that we need to understand the storyline, the plan of redemption. Well, I'm a Christian. That's it. I mean, think of, no, this is God's plan. You were born for such a time as this. You could have been born in the first century church. You could have. You could have been King Henry VIII's wife, one that still kept her head. You could have been anybody. But no. I'll never forget this line from this movie one time. This line in this movie was very, very interesting. These two guys were talking. And one guy says, you know what? I didn't ask to be here. Why am I here? I didn't ask to be here. But now that I'm here, what am I supposed to do? Audrey, did you ask God, hey, can I go down there for a little bit? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I got the fifth grade and kiss. No. Pfft, here's Audrey. Bam, here's Audrey. Maybe because I'm older, I'm contemplating these things. My life. What is the life expectancy of a male in Brandon? I don't want to know. <laughs> and some of you don't want to know either. Hey, how come I'm still alive? I'm past life expectancy. That's like the yogurt. It's still good. Don't go by that date. <laughs> Smell it. Stir it. It's, it's good. I pass it off to leadership every week. <laughs> Just scratch off the date of that yogurt. Yeah, I'd be fine. Hey, this ain't yogurt. This is cottage cheese. <laughs> Enjoy. It's part of the budget. You liked that, didn't you? Now listen, right now, in the culture in which we live, and, and, and the, in, these, in the times of this world, there's racism. There's prejudice. There's people that literally think that they are Israel, black Hebrew Israelites, and the, the Jews that are in Israel are not even true Jews. This is going on right now in our midst. It's foolishness. No, really, it's foolishness. Jesus died for all of mankind, all ethnic groups. He denied no one to come and bow to him and worship him and stuff. Do you understand that? See, that's why we're on the verge of something great here at Beit Tehila. Don't be, don't be deluded. Don't be deceived. You want your inheritance, you're going to get it. You know what I'm saying? 
So Joseph's brothers were so jealous that they threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery where he ended up in Egypt. They took his coat, dipped in goat's blood, and lied to their father that a wild beast killed him. Genesis 37, verses 18 through 36. And notice the favor of God was on Joseph in all of his trials, and he ended up from the pit to the palace when he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. Genesis 41, 25, pretty cool story from the pit to the palace. Now Joseph gets a second uh, in command position under Pharaoh in Egypt to lead them in seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Genesis chapter 41, verses 40 through 44. I mean, these are all my notes because you don't need the PowerPoints. So Pharaoh changes Joseph's name, which means he shall add to, Joseph means he shall add to, to Zavnath Paania, which means a revealer of secrets, or the man to whom secrets are revealed. So Pharaoh names him Zaphnath Paania, a revealer of secrets, or the man to whom secrets are revealed. So I'm from the house of Joseph, and secrets have been revealed to me. The secret things belong to who? To God. But what about those things that are revealed to us and our children? Does anybody understand that? Do you understand that? Joseph was a dreamer. My dad said, you take away a man's dreams, he has nothing. Boy, I'm a dreamer. Are you a dreamer? I like dreaming. Because dreaming can make you mine. I like dreaming. Holding your hand and feeling fine. You know that? You know that song? And everybody criticizes Elvis and his movies. Think about it. I think about it. I think about songs when I get revelation. Man, I remember this song and this and that, you know. It's just like the, the, the group, The Who, you know. Uh, Ryan's there, you know, and I didn't start singing, but he did. So the spirit of me must have been upon him. And he's like, who are you? Who, 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 who? And I'm like, okay, Ryan, that was good. You know what's funny about the who? The song is, who are you? So these guys don't even know who they are. (laughs) Hey, who are you? The who? Who? The who? Oh, and by the way, I went back and, and did a lyrical version of that song, and uh, it, it's got cursing in it. I didn't even realize that until I went back, like, oh, hey, vey, I'm not singing that no more. I was like, what was that? <laughs> I'm like, no, not this Shabbat. <laughs> but you don't even realize it until you go back and study it and break it down, right? But really, who are you? Who are you? Think about it. Now, this is where it gets to be very interesting. So Pharaoh gave Joseph a wife named Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. So now, all of a sudden, Joseph is married to an Egyptian priest's daughter. How many of that's messed up? He's a Hebrew. Before the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, and the first son was named Manasseh, which means forgetting. The second son was named Ephraim, and it means fruitful. See, remember Joseph tried to share his dreams and he was persecuted and thrown in a pit and scolded. He shares his dreams with Pharaoh and interprets dreams and he's elevated and gets a new coat and gets a position. Before he was beat down, sold as a slave, he lost everything. So the first son comes and he's like, forgetting. Because look at me now. My dreams are coming true. And he remembers the dreams, does he not? He's, he was given those dreams for a reason. Notice that Ephraim and Manasseh were born during times of plenty. It's now. We're not in a famine. Maybe a famine for the word of God, but we're not in a physical famine. We're not. Isn't that interesting that the revelation of Ephraim is now? So when the famine hit all across the land, Joseph's brothers came down to Egypt to buy food, and Joseph knew his brethren, but they did not recognize him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So what the Father has done to you is he's deposited his Torah on your mind and your heart that you would begin to respond to the land of Israel and Jewish people. He did that for you. He didn't do that for everybody. He did that for you. 
I didn't have any association with Jewish people whatsoever. The only story I can recall was a, a girl named Jackie Shulman who was Jewish. She didn't come to school one day because it was, it, was it was a feast day in Leviticus, I guess. And she said, well, yeah, yesterday was a holiday. I said, no, it wasn't. That's my story. Some of you have incredible stories of living near Jewish neighborhoods and, 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 and Jewish this. And, no. I mean, I was anti-Semitic, but I have nothing to do with Jewish people. I was Nick at night. I had my own world, you know what I'm saying? It's happening now. See, see, I recognize the Jewish people as my brothers and sisters. But they don't recognize me. They call me a righteous Gentile. And let's look at that. Joseph put his brothers to the test until finally he reveals himself to them. Now, we don't know if God said put them to the test or he put them to the test. But he put them to the test, did he not? Joseph puts his brothers to the test until finally he reveals himself to them. Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 4. So Joseph's older brother, Judah, was willing to put his life in the place of Benjamin, and that is the lesson learned. Judah learned his lesson. Remember, he was the instigator. Let's sell him. Let's get rid of him. They wanted to kill him. It was so bad, the sibling rivalry. Joseph knows all of this stuff. So when Judah steps up and says, hey, I'll step up for Benjamin, Joseph's like, well, that's my little brother. You pass the test. Check. See, there's being tests given to all of us whether we're even going to go into the land or not. Some of you may disqualify yourself. That's good because somebody else is going to get your land. It's going to be me. Sorry. I'm going to get everything that God has for me and my family. My wife and I are in total agreement that we are in this. We're in it to win it. No going back. No second guessing. We want it. We want it all. I want everything that God has for me. And if you can't learn from Hayovel, that organization, then you haven't learned the lessons to let go and let God. Amen? So isn't Joseph a beautiful story? Let's read it. Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 4. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, he calls every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, and he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Amen? Amen? He said, cause every man to go out from me. Listen to me. Not everyone is privy to the family reunion and to the intimacy that will come from it. This will be a, a reunion like you've never seen before. But it's going to be by the Spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So you can rest assured of that, that he is going to do it. Continuing on. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Jewish commentary would say that Joseph revealed himself, his circumcision, to prove. Because Egyptians don't circumcise. Either way, he came nearer to his brethren and revealed himself. Amen? So when you don't have Jewish people in your life, when they don't come here, how can you reveal yourself? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? How can you reveal yourself if the Jewish people aren't even in your life? I don't have to tell them, I'm Ephraim, I'm this. No, they call me a righteous Gentile or whatever. Hey, Christians with Torah. Good catchphrase. But we know who our brothers are, but they don't know who we are. Isn't that good? That's what's been happening at Beit Tehila. Judah emails me. Judah calls me, and I'm having them come. Because it's the story. It's the story of restoration and regathering. Let's get into Moses. I think I bit off more than I can chew, but it's okay. I'll be chewing and chewing. Exodus 2.10, let's read it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. His name ain't even Hebrew. It means to be drawn out. What does the, the word church mean? Called out. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Amen? 
Think about it. Isn't that good? Isn't that good stuff? Moses was raised as an Egyptian, but later in life found out he was a Hebrew. He was chosen by God to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. Exodus 3.10. Does everybody see that? He's the deliverer. He's, he's the one to deliver them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You thought you were something when you were nothing. I thought I was Roman Catholic. Really, I'm Roman Catholic. I was proud of that. It was all my dog tags. But look what happens. Our paradigm changes, our, our viewpoints. God reveals himself. Isn't it the coolest thing? Because you could know a lot but not even act on it. Then it's not, it's not even going to work out because faith without works is dead. Amen? Is that a good word? These stories are just like you. It happened in the Bible. It's happening to you. Rahab the harlot, Joshua 2, 1. Let's read it. Joshua, the son of Nun, set out of Sheatim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Some people would challenge us, how can you call Rahab a harlot? Because they called her one. It's her house. I mean, <laughs> right? And I love what Joshua did. He learned his lesson from Moses. Moses sends 12 spies in. He's like, I ain't doing that again. I'm only sending two. Right? Yeah. Let's continue on. Joshua 6, 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Amen? I got a lot of examples here, I know. It's going to help you, though. Rahab the harlot, she had a house, amen? Check out Hebrews 11.31. She made the whole faith. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. She hid them, protected them. Why? She believed in something greater. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not. James 2.25, let's read it. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Because she believed and she did. She spared the spies. She hid them because she had faith. Faith without works is dead. If you don't go to the land of Israel or on a trip, how can you get the land of Israel? You won't even go on a trip. Amen? Rahab the harlot not only saves herself, but her immediate family from destruction. She goes from being a Gentile to entering into the commonwealth of Israel along with her family. Now, I know there's some controversy or whatever, but Rahab is also part of the line of the Messiah, Yeshua, through the tribe of Judah. We're going we're gonna to see that after we see the verse that I'm going to use for Ruth. I kind of tied the two in together. But think about it. Rahab's not the harlot anymore. She's been absorbed into the commonwealth of Israel. Isn't that the coolest thing? It's interesting because who's controlling Jericho today but Palestinians? Isn't that wild? Let's look at Ruth the Moabite. Let's read it. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Continuing on. And they took the wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Milan and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Wow. Boy, this is a movie, isn't it? After Naomi's husband's death, along with her two sons, she was left with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Husband dies, two sons die. All she's got are the two daughter-in-laws. Let me know what I'm talking about. So when Naomi heard that there was bread in the land of Judah... 
return back and encourage her daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. Isn't that interesting? How many Jews have left the land of Israel only to return this century? Right? Now let's hear Ruth's proclamation. So Naomi hears, hey, you know what? There's bread in the land. I should go back to my homeland. Is that happening today among the Jewish people? Let's check out Ruth's proclamation. Ruth chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Here we go. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Notice, Ruth clave unto her. She was a Klingon. She was a Trekkie. Keep reading. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. Is that it? Check it out. Is that where thou diest? There we go. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So if you look at the, 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 the kingdom of God, if you, look, if you look at the kingdom of Israel, the north and the south, Ephraim and Judah, if you look, Ephraim was taken captive first, right? 722 into Assyria, and then 586, Judah goes, right? What's happened in this century? Judah comes back, Joseph will follow. Because how you take something apart is how you put it back together. And some of you are like, hey, look, I got extra parts. I'm not getting on that plane. We think it's so complicated, but it's not. Ruth asks, for permission from Naomi to work in the fields of Boaz, who was a kinsman to Naomi. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So now all of a sudden there's this kinsman redeemer, amen? And who's the part of this? But, but Ruth and Naomi together. It takes those two to have the kinsman redeemer. It doesn't work for just Naomi. Ruth's got to be in the picture. So Naomi instructs Ruth what to do in regards to getting Boaz to marry her. Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. This is kind of interesting, too, because this is during the time of what? The judges. And our king is coming. Yeshua is coming. And, and the monarchy is coming. Isn't it interesting? There's a lot of, uh, uh, of conversation about the monarchy in England and different things. We're talking about the monarchy, the monarchy. But, but here, we're in the book of Judges. The kinsman who was closer to Naomi than Boaz forfeited his position, and so Boaz was able to marry Ruth and be the kinsman for Naomi. Ruth chapter 4, verse 6. Isn't that cool? Wow. Let's read it. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilean's and Milan's of the hand of Naomi. This is Ruth chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Goes on to say, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Milan, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon the, his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place ye are witnesses this day. Amen? Isn't that a beautiful story? Look at this. Was her identity changed tremendously, physically, geographically, mentally? Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 and 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Wow. So Ruth and Boaz were King David's great-grandparents. How about the New Testament, Matthew 1, 5? Let's read it. And Salmon begat Booz of Rahab, and Booz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Do you see Rahab's lineage from the tribe of Judah even here? Very interesting, isn't it? Think about it. Isn't that the coolest thing? It's very cool. Let's look at the last one. Saul of Tarsus, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. I love the Apostle Paul. Here's, he's the Saul of Tarsus starting out. 
And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Is Saul of Tarsus going to get an identity change? Look what he says in Philippians 3, 5. Look what he says. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, I'm a Pharisee. Right? But what happens? Saul has an encounter with Yeshua near Damascus. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And then what happens? Ananias is sent to Saul by the Lord to, to minister to him in Damascus. This is what's really interesting. Here's Saul's mission. He tells Ananias about Saul of Tarsus. He says, But the Lord said unto him, which was Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Listen, there's a lot of people out there that discredit the Apostle Paul. They say he's schizophrenic. Sometimes he kept Torah, sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he felt like a nut, sometimes he didn't. But let me assure you, the Apostle Paul is kosher. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. He's sent to the house of Joseph to pull out a people for his name's sake. So if you can muddy the waters of the Apostle Paul, you will miss out on your own personal instructions. And that's what people do. I'll discredit Paul. Will you discredit yourself? Amen? Saul receives his sight. It's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's baptized. Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. Pretty cool, isn't it? In the Greek, he literally was blinded. It says there were physical scales. He literally had physical scales over his eyes that fell off. Saul of Tarsus becomes the apostle Paul. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, Romans 11, 13, and 1 Corinthians 1, 1. Not going to get into all of it. But how many of you know that the Saul of Tarsus was transformed? He was a murderer. He held Stephen's, you know, he, he held the coast while they stoned Stephen. How many know there, his life was totally changed? Amen? I love this quote by Reggie White. He said to me, football is what I did but it's not who I am. Amen? Just like Jeff Batchelder was sharing about his, his background, his education, and, and, and the jobs that he held. Amen? That's what you do. That's not who you are. So when you lose your job, you're not losing your identity. You're getting an opportunity to do something else because of who you are. See, right now, God said, I'll shake the heavens and the earth, the land and the seas. That's why you see all these fires in Australia, and you see these earthquakes and all these things, because what God is showing you is that this is what he's doing in the spiritual realm. He's shaking things up. That's how you get fruit off a tree. You shake the heck out of it. Example of Nicholas Everett Plummer's identity. Check this out. I'm a male. I know I'm a male. I'm a son in the flesh and in the spirit. I'm a brother, a nephew, an uncle, a grandson, a cousin, et cetera, et cetera. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a Christian pastor. I am a comedian. Thank you. That's when the laughs come. I'm Israel. Romans eleven seventeen, 17, Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13. Romans eleven seventeen 17 is about being grafted in as a wild branch. And you know that I'm wild because I know that I'm wild because I can't even tame myself. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, I'm part of the commonwealth of Israel. Why? Because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Because of that, he has brought me near. He says, now you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. It's so funny. I got my son Josiah all into the monarchy now. I thought I was the only one having tea. He's like, you haven't finished the season of the crown yet? <laughs> He's all into it now. Because there's something about the monarchy that's coming. Amen. I love this one. You are what you eat. That's scary, isn't it, for some of you? You are what you eat. Is that, is that true? 
You are what you eat. That's scary, isn't it? It's all about identity, isn't it? We're finishing up here. So I gave you some biblical examples. I want to encourage you. We have so much work to do. We have so much work to do. We have so much to meditate on and think about what God is doing that it's very exciting. Amen? Now, an identity change can even be found in some movies like The Princess Diaries, 2001. Great movie. Great movie. Princess Diaries. I encourage you to, to check it out. It's the picture of you. You're the nerdy little girl. Okay? The headphones and the cool shades, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to get into the plot because I want to finish up here because I, I want some chili. But basically, she had to make a decision. Does she want to be a princess? Does she want to go through the training? Does she want to leave her home? Does she want to take on the responsibility? You'll have to see the movie for yourself to see if she, she does it or not. I'll just tell you that there's Princess Diaries too. So I'm just saying that we see all these things in Hollywood. We see all these things around us, yet it's not even relevant to us. This is what's happening all around us. Amen? You're a princess. You're a prince. Amen? I love it. I guess she's trying to tell her she's a princess and this and that. And she says, shut up. Like, that's cool, you know. And she ran from the table. She just freaked out, you know. It's like you tell people you're Israel. They freak out. They run. What? But your identity will dictate your lifestyle. Amen? You want to have somebody go put out a fire, don't get the guy that looks like the milkman. Right? Your identity will dictate your lifestyle. Moving on here. I'm finishing up. Now, the political identity of nations are changing. The political identity of nations are changing. An example I would like to use is, of course, the United Kingdom. Amen. I got my DNA back. I'm like 51% Welsh, Irish, Scottish, and then 20% English, right? And so I've always wondered why I like tea so much and the monarchy. I was always wondering all these things, you know, and come to find out that's my, my DNA. Amen. Um, but if you'll see this particular uh, map here of the United Kingdom, I just want to run this by you that uh, the conservatives or the Tories ran away with the election. Now, I would love to read more about the, the, the article I wanted to read, but for the sake of time, I'm not. But it was like a landslide victory for the conservatives. And all I'm going to say is this. I think that churches should be political. Okay? I'm a political pastor. Okay? And, and I want to endorse liberty, you know, our constitution, you know, I, I want to I endorse that. I want to promote that. You know, your rights, your liberty. Because what's happening is, if you haven't noticed, and I don't care what party you're from, uh, a Republican, a Democrat, or, or whatever, no party affiliation, independent. But the bottom line is that the Democrats have been hijacked. They've got so, they're so far left that they're socialists. I'm sorry, but do you believe in socialism? And the concept is, you know, just spread it out for everyone. Everyone's equal. But, but see, that goes against God. Socialism goes against God. Am I for social welfare or to help people? No. But even God shows you what? Classes of people. In the sacrifices, remember? Some can bring a bull. Some can bring a, a sheep or a goat. Some can bring the turtle doves or flower. There's, all, there's three classes of people right there. Jesus even said the poor you'll always have. And what did Jesus say? I'm going to come back and give to every man according to his works. Amen? I'm going to tell you right now, if I sit on my blessed assurance and I just fill a position as a pastor, I'm not going to get anything at the end of my life because I didn't do what he told me to do. Now, why he chose me, why he's sharing all this with me, I, I, can't, I don't know. I wonder every day. I said, Lord, get somebody else. He hired me. He's the only one that can fire me. I have no fear. I don't fear man because he didn't put me here. He didn't tell me to say these things. I'm saying what God told me to say because I fear him. You know, I don't have a lot of friends. Amen? I don't have a lot of friends. There's been a lot of accusations made against me, and I'm taking all of you into Judaism and all this crazy stuff. None of it's true. I think the worst accusation is telling Jesus he has demons. Are you kidding me? 
He created them. The fallen angels, the cherubs. Jesus is full of devils. Don't attribute the acts of God to the devil. And it's funny, those that criticize the two houses or the two sticks aren't even living it. They have nothing to do with it. So why criticize my faith when you're not even living my faith? That's a good word. I'm just telling you. Amen? It's just common sense. Finishing up here. Sons and daughters, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Let's finish it up here just so you understand. Let's read it. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what com communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? In what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Remember, he's speaking to a culture that was immersed in Greek mythology with many temples. Rich T's Europe, he's showing all the Greek temples. You see these ruins? This was Zeus's hangout. <laughs> some pillars and some tumbleweeds, right? Some maps of Greece sold on the side. And that's what Zeus has to show for those that believe in him. You shall be my sons and daughters. We're sons and daughters of the commandments. How about the families in Jeremiah 31 1? The families, where do we find where God said he'll write his Torah on minds and hearts? What chapter in Jeremiah 31? You should check out Jeremiah 30 and 31. It's incredible. Look at look what Jeremiah 31 1 says. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Matter of fact, the caption above this verse says a happy return. So what are you saying, Pastor Nick? What I'm saying is that everything we are experiencing today in your own personal life can be found in the prophets. Nobody's reading the prophets. You can't just come in here and wing it and not figure it out. Why are you wanting to do Shabbat? Why are you not eating pork chops? Why do you want to go to Israel? Why in the heck would you have an Orthodox Jew come in here and talk to you? Why, why, why? It's because of who we are. You have to explain the phenomenon scripturally. It doesn't matter about the critics. Jesus told me a long time ago when I became a pastor, he said, never go to the critics. Let the critics come to you. My son Nehemiah was, was sharing with me that, 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 that during the services, they, they get some, and Pastor Russell knows this, well, we get some negativity, people saying that we're heretics and this and that. It's none of your business what we are and who we are. If you can't comment nice, don't comment at all, because we are going to erase you. Because you are the weakest link. Can you imagine that? What'd you do today? I criticized three churches. I'm exhausted. Why don't you go start your own church? I could use some help. Keep your mouth shut, but I'll take you in. You know what I'm saying? I'm 52. I want to get something done. I've been a young, foolish kid, okay? I've done things. I've had fun. I've done all that. I've run the streets. I want to do something for the Lord. I want to show something. When we got this building, man, a big burden lifted off me because Pastor Randy handed me the keys to the car and I took the fellowship hall for a spin. Woohoo, this is great. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my gosh, a million dollar budget? It's going to take a million dollars? I don't know, man. I kind of like this fellowship hall. It handles good, it spins around good. And I think we got, we can manage this. Man, I was sweating bullets thinking about this loan and everything, right? You guys don't understand. The mortgage is $5,000 a month for this building because I have faith that God wants us and he'll provide. But I've never just got a check from God that said, God, 
$5,000, pay the mortgage. No, it comes through all of you that share the faith. It comes from all of you because you give to what you believe in. If you believe in Starbucks and coffee, you're going to give for a cup of coffee. You're not going to think twice. It doesn't matter how much it is. It's a latte. You know what I'm saying? I told the barista, thank you. I can't make this at home. Say what you want, how much it costs. If you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going. I know I ran over. This might have seemed like a lot to take in, but I just delivered a 10-pound baby, and it was, it was great. And I delivered it. Now I'll get to go and have some fellowship, and I, and I did what I was told to do. So in closing, one last thought. An identity crisis can occur at any age and in any set of circumstances, but it's equally unnerving no matter what those conditions are. Our sense of self is vital to our happiness. And when that sense of self becomes fractured, it can be devastating. Learning how to regain your sense of self can help you overcome an identity crisis and find happiness. Everybody in here has value. From my wife and I, the leadership, the board, everybody has value, whether you agree or not. Every homo sapien, you are made in the image of God. You have value because God doesn't make junk. And you are a son and daughter of God. And that's one of the things, when, when enemy tries to hit me with this sinus thing or whatever he tries to do or put this stuff on me, like, oh, you're a failure. You're never going to make it. You're a kook. You're this. And, and I hear that voice. I'm like, no, you know what? I, I said, you know what? I am not a failure. I am a success, and I am a son of God. And that is what I say all the time. See, so many people right now, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they're going. Amen? How much can we share the blessing of the Lord? How much could we get from the Lord and just get past, just get over the hump there? How many of us want to do that? I can't make anything happen. This isn't hype. This ain't sensationalism. I'm not trying to get you to drink Kool-Aid. I'm giving you an opportunity. Amen? I'm giving you an opportunity to see something bigger than you. Because if the promise is a divine assurance of good, I definitely don't know what good is. But you have to practice your faith. When someone asks you about your faith, you should be able to give them a response. Why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? We've got to know doctrine. Doctrine is what you do. Theology is what you think. This is your life, folks. I'm 52. I'm not playing around. And the cool thing is, I thought I'd have more people or we'd be further along. But you know what? God waits for no man. He is moving. This train has left the station. I'm serious. I got to put my running shoes on. He's, I'm running with God. Amen? There's no going back. I don't lay in bed and have regrets. I'm not going to take back one Take that one down, Pastor Russell. That one, I, I don't believe that anymore. Take that one down. No, I'm telling you, I'm amazed at boxes of teachings and outlines and, and Torah that God has given me because it's not me at all. It's Him. I couldn't believe all the boxes of notes from Torah portions, all my teachings. It's, it's hundreds of teachings. You talk about binge watching YouTube Bait to Heal a channel, we're going to beat Netflix. Guess. Music, dancing, teachings. I mean, there's a buffet on there in case you haven't known. So think about it. Hazak, hazak, benish, hazik. Be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. We go from Joseph now to Moses, who's the deliverer. And what's the book of Exodus about? It's from groan to glory. The glory's coming. The glory's here. His mercies are new every day. So be encouraged. I wonder about a lot of things. I do a lot of reading. I watch little snippets of, of, of the, the parliament in England. And, and you know, a week before Purim, Israel's having an election. This is not by chance. It's a destiny. Something's happening in the government of Israel. Something's got to give so that we can make Aliyah. Right now, there's a big stink over the Russian Jews because they're saying 30% aren't even Jews. 
But they're over there. How are you going to fish them out? What are you going to do? It's too late now. Oi vey. They let people in that they didn't want to let in. It's too late now. You open up Pandora's box. <laughs> right? That's a can of worms. This is what they're struggling with. So what's happening is they're so strict on Aliyah that we can never be over there. We need a government that's going to allow us to make Aliyah or give us a visa for more than just three months. Do you know that? We can't be citizens. We can't just go over there. And I guarantee you, the government of Israel is vetting Beit Tehillah. Amen? There's people getting on a plane. They can't even go to Israel because they're in the, in the what, BDS movement. They're saying, you're not coming in our country. They're going to block you. And, and what we're discovering is that the, the Israeli government or the Jewish people are saying, hey, if you could come alongside us and help us, we want people like you. What did Jesus say? If you're not against me, you're for me. And we're for the Jewish people. Amen? We're Christians before. It's funny, the last 30 days, we've, the most hits we've had other than the United States is from Gibraltar. You ever been to Gibraltar? No, me neither. Remember the Straits of Gibraltar? It's the southern tip of Spain where the ships come into the Mediterranean, remember? But it's, a, it's, it's I feel so good. But it, it's a British colony. It's Spanish territory, but it's a British colony, right, Mrs. Campbell? So think about it. There's interesting things that, that God is doing. Interesting things that God is doing. So just be encouraged. You know, and, and if you keep reading the Torah portions, you're going you're to make it. So much to take in. Keep praying. Keep worshiping. Practice your faith. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you for this word. Thank you, Father, that we are uh, a people likened to a city, a city likened to a people, which is Jerusalem. And, and, and Yeshua, you, you cried out and you said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you, but you would not. Uh, because of that, your house is left to you desolate. But Yeshua, we are drawn to you. Yeshua, we lift you up so that all men, women, and children may be drawn unto you. Yeshua, you are the root of the olive tree. You sustain us. Apart from you, Yeshua, we can do nothing. Father, I thank you that your word will not come back null and void. I pray that this word would bring forth a hundredfold. I know there's 30, 60, and 100, but I want a hundredfold return. Bring your sons and daughters home. Bring us home, Father. Bring us to the place where you want us to be because we trust you because you're our Abba and your promise is a divine assurance of good. We ask this in the name above all names, the name of our soon coming King, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth. Amen. Be blessed. Thank you so much.